Would you turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm going to read the whole chapter now before I try to bring this message. The title of the message is Knowledge or Charity. And you'll see why I entitled it as I read this passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth, or builds up. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. This is what God recognizes. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there's none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one, Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit, there's not in every man that knowledge. For some, with conscience of the idol, unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge set at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall thy weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Knowledge or charity. Paul says in verse 1, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. It swells one with pride, spiritual edema, as it were. But charity builds up. Now, one of the issues that was brought up to Paul was whether or not it was okay to eat meat that had been used for sacrifices to a pagan deity. They wanted to know if it's acceptable to do that. They couldn't go to Kroger's or Sam's like you and I to buy meat. They had to go to a marketplace where really the only meat you could get was meat that had been desecrated and used for idolatrous purposes, sacrificed to false gods. And they were saying, is it okay to eat that kind of meat? That seems wrong to eat something that was used for such a desecrated, idolatrous purpose. So they present this question to Paul. Is it okay for us to eat that meat. And through that dilemma, we're given this important teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. The knowledge he's speaking of is what he stated in verse 4. 
As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know. Here's what we know. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is none other God but one. We know those idols that they're sacrificing to are non-existent gods. We all know that, and that's proper knowledge. That is not saving knowledge, but you won't have salvation apart from this knowledge. And he says regarding this, we all have this knowledge. And then he makes this unusual statement. Knowledge puffs up. Knowledge swells one with pride. Charity builds up. It edifies. Now, is he saying that knowledge is unimportant? Of course not. There is no salvation apart from the knowledge of the truth. If someone does not have the knowledge of the truth, neither do they have salvation. Now, I can give so many scriptures that speak of this. The Lord said, with regard to his people, you shall know the truth. There's an actual knowledge of what is called the truth, the actual content of the gospel. And if somebody doesn't have that knowledge, they're not saved. There is no salvation apart from knowledge. Salvation itself and all that's implied in that glorious word of God saving a sinner is described in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, as God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There is no salvation apart from the knowledge of the truth. There's something called the truth that has a definite content, and I love the way the Lord said, I am the truth. That's the best way to summarize it. I am the truth. And to not know the truth is to not have salvation. Faith. Faith. Paul spoke in Titus 1.1 of, listen to this, the faith of God's elect. I love that. All of God's elect, all of those whom he chose before time began to be saved, have the same faith. They believe the same thing. I remember... One time hearing one of these contemporary religious songs and it said we all believe but not the same thing. Wrong. We believe the same thing. It's called the faith of God's elect, the acknowledging of the truth, the full embracing of the truth, which is after godliness. That's where it comes from. The Lord's done something for that person. They, uh, th there's godliness there. The, the new birth, they... Acknowledge and embrace the truth. Listen to this scripture from 2 Timothy 2.25, speaking of repentance. What is repentance? Well, here's Paul's definition of repentance. If you want to know what repentance is, he says in 2 Timothy 2.25, if God will peradventure, grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now, that's what repentance is. It's a change of mind and an acknowledging of, an embracing of, the recognition of the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. There is no salvation apart from the knowledge of the truth. Listen to this scripture. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you unto salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. What is the evidence of the sanctifying work of God the Holy Spirit? Belief of the truth. What is the cause of belief of the truth? The sanctifying work of God the Holy Spirit. There is no salvation apart from 
the truth. The gospel has a content, the knowledge of the truth, that if I personally don't have, I am as yet unsaved. So don't devalue the truth, the knowledge of the truth, from what he says. There is no salvation apart from the knowledge of the truth. That's what the Bible teaches. So what does Paul mean when he says we all have knowledge? Knowledge puffs up, swells one with pride, but charity builds up. It edifies. What does Paul mean by knowledge puffing up? Well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for just a moment. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, I can tell you what everything in the Bible means. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, I've got miracle working faith and have not charity. I am nothing. Now when he's talking about this knowledge that puffs up, he's talking about knowledge without love. All that knowledge does is fill one with pride and it's not saving knowledge this is that kind of knowledge that makes you feel proud I know something you don't know I have an advantage over you I know this you do not that kind of knowledge doesn't do anything but swell somebody up with pride we've all we've all been around the guy that thinks he's the smartest guy in the room with his inflated, puffed-up opinion of himself. Now, that kind of knowledge, <coughs> unlike the wisdom that is from above, fills one with pride. That's all it does. Knowledge puffeth up. But charity builds up. Charity, rather than seeking to lord it over people, I've got this knowledge you don't have. It seeks to build up others. Now, I want you to think of the impact of this statement. Knowledge puffs up. Is he saying anything against knowledge? He's saying something against knowledge without love. He is. Knowledge puffs up. Swells one with pride and self-righteousness and self-importance. Causes you to look down at the person who doesn't know as much as you. Charity. True charity, the gift of God's grace, builds up. Now look what he says in verse 2, back into our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And if any man think that he knows anything, he knows nothing, as yet as he ought to know. If there is any part of the scripture, if there's any doctrine of the scripture of which you or I think, well, I've got that one down. I've got that. I've grasped that. If I think of any truth from the scriptures in that light, all I prove is I have no understanding of it. I know nothing as I ought to know. When I think I've got it down, I'm actually letting everybody know what a fool I am and how deceived I am with regard to my own knowledge. Oh, the Bible is exceeding broad. Every truth of Scripture is exceeding broad. Somebody says, well, I've got a grasp of that. No, you don't. We believe. Now, we do believe. I, I believe everything the Bible says. I, my, one of my favorite statements is the statement by Donnie Bell. He says, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd believe it. I would. I would. I believe the Bible's the inspired word of God. I believe everything in it. But as far as having an intellectual comprehension of everything it's teaching, I just believe it. Can, can you understand how God is one God and three persons? Of course you can't. 
Do you believe it? Yes, you do. With all your heart. Do you understand how God never had a beginning? No, it blows your mind. But do you believe it? Yes, you do. Do you believe that God is the first cause behind everything? Absolutely sovereign? Yes, I do. Do you understand how it's all working together? No, I don't, but I believe. This thing of knowledge, it doesn't mean I've got some kind of full cognitive grasp of something. Uh, and if I think I do, I prove how filled with pride and, and wrong thoughts of myself that I have. Now, that's what Paul is saying. I, I love that passage of Scripture in Galatians chapter 6, verse 3, where it says, If a man thinketh himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Now, do you hear that? Do I hear that? If a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing. Do you believe that you're nothing? If you believe that Christ is all, you believe you're nothing. But that doesn't bother you because he's all. And having nothing but Christ, you have all things. That's a great place to be, isn't it? If any man thinketh that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. All I do is prove to everybody how ignorant I am when I have such a high opinion of my knowledge. Verse 3. Before I read verse 3, I want to make this statement. True knowledge always brings humility. If it doesn't bring humility, it's not that knowledge that's from above. It's not God teaching you. Where God teaches someone, there will always be humility. But, verse 3, if any man love God, the same is known of him, of God. This is what God recognizes. Somebody says, does God recognize all the knowledge I have? Do you think he's impressed with your knowledge? He's omniscient. He's never learned anything. And you, I think of what the Lord said to Job. Who is this that darkeneth counsel with words without knowledge? God's not impressed with any man's knowledge. Oh, I know this. You don't know anything you ought to know. Just say, you know, I really, I really feel that. I, I feel it. I know you do too. I, I know nothing as I ought to know. I, do, do I, I know the Lord, but there's so little of him I know. Because he's so glorious. He's so vast. He's so infinite. We all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. Charity edifies. This is what the Lord recognizes. Says, is love to his Person. This is what he recognizes. Romans 8, 28 says we know that all things work together for good to them that who? That what? Love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says we love him. Because he first loved us. Because he first loved us, we do love him. We love his person. When a man loves God, he loves who he is. He loves all of his attributes. He loves his word. He loves the way he saves by Christ. He loves the way he saves by grace. He trusts his character. He wouldn't change a thing about God if it was in his power to. Now, he's the only one... I wouldn't change him if I could. With regard to all of his attributes, I love them. I love his holiness, his otherness. I love his sovereignty. The fact that he controls and rules and reigns in everything, that everybody is in his hand. You're in his hand. I'm in his hand. Everybody else is in his hand. And he's going to do with us whatever he's pleased to do because he's, that's who he is. 
I love his independence. You know, a God that needs me, I don't need. A God that needs anything, I don't need. He's God. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He's God. I love his power, his omnipotence, that he has the power to do whatever it is he wills to do. I love his wisdom, the way he's made a way to be absolutely just and make me just within and of myself. I know I'm nothing but sin. I love his wisdom. I love every attribute of God. I love his immutability, how he never changes. He's always the same. I love God. Now, when you think of your love to God, you probably don't feel, you ought to love him a lot more, shouldn't you? You ought, you ought to love him a whole lot more than you do. And I, nobody's making any argument against that. I know that's the case with myself, but I do love him. I love when the Lord said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? He didn't say, Peter, are you sorry? Peter, have you shown sufficient remorse? Peter, do you promise that this is never going to happen again? Peter, have you taken steps to make sure this is not going to happen again? Peter, do you love my person? I'm not asking you about the depth of your love. I'm asking you this. Do you love my person? Do you love who I am? Do you love my way of salvation? Do you love me? Oh, I love Peter's answer. Yea, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. They might not. They might even, might have been the other apostles. Let's see what he says. Hypocrite. He goes out and denies the Lord before that little maid. Let's see what he says. Let's see how he answers this question. I, I'm sure he was being judged by the disciples, although they were just as guilty as he was. But I'm sure this was going on. But, you know, Peter wasn't thinking about them or what they would think. He said, Lord, you know all things. I'm appealing to your omniscience. You know that I love you. We love his justice, we love his grace, we love his mercy, we love the way he forgives sins. Now, the reason we take false doctrine personally is because we love his person. I can't listen to that which is contrary to him without being upset. You know why? Because I love his person. I love who he is, and I can't stand somebody trying to bring him down to human terms. He's God. He's other. And I take that which is contrary to him personally because I love his person and I know his person. If you love somebody, if somebody doesn't like that person you love, you're not okay with that because you love that person. Now this is what God recognizes, that person who loves him. Not the person who has all kinds of knowledge. That person who thinks they have all kinds of knowledge, it's uh, false knowledge. It's not real knowledge, or they wouldn't be thinking the way they did because true knowledge always humbles a man and brings him into the dust and brings him to the feet of Christ. This is what God recognizes. Love to his person. And let's go on reading. Verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. Now, they had been sacrificed to idols. There had been sinful activity involved. There had been sexual immorality involved. There was every perverse thing that was involved in this pagan culture and this sacrificing to their false gods. Surely, we shouldn't eat something that had been used in such a desecrated purpose. Well, here's how Paul answers this. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. And that there is none other God 
but one. Now, these idols are non-existent gods. And let me be real plain. The God of the Muslims is a God that does not exist. The God of the Hindus is a God that does not exist. The God of most of what goes on under the name of Christianity, a God that can't do things unless you let him. He's got to wait to see what you do before he can act. That is a God that does not exist. It is a false God, an idol, a non-existent God. So that meat was offered to a non-existent God. We understand there's none other God but one. For though, verse 5, there's only one true and living God, the God of the Bible. He's God. Everything else is an idol. Everything else is a non-existent God. For though, verse 5, there be that are called gods. You know, there's a lot of different kinds of gods that are called gods. My God's like, I don't know how many times. Uh, uh, I've heard this a lot of times. My God's not like that. When I say who God is, my God's not like that. Well, I know he's not. But your God's a non-existent God. And I'm not saying that smart alecky. I'm saying that he's not God. God is the God of the Bible. Now, there are a lot of gods. There's the God of the Muslims, the God of the, uh, all the different religions, the God of the Jews, the God of so-called Christianity, a lot of different gods. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. You know, there's a lot of people who call Jesus Christ the Lord Jesus, but they don't mean what the Bible means. It's a difference. Uh, there are even landlords. There's all kinds of gods. There's gods many. There's lords many. But, verse 6, to us, there is but one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. The God of the Bible. I'm so thankful for the scripture. We couldn't even know God apart from him making himself known in this word. I'm so thankful for the infallible, holy scriptures. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. We would know God had he not given us his word to tell us who he is. Now, to us there's but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. Now, the God of the Bible is the one of whom are all things. That's speaking of his absolute sovereignty. Everything he's in control of. He purposed. Doesn't matter what it is. He's in control of all things. Whatever You take whatever's under the umbrella of all things, he's in absolute control of that. And he says... There's one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things, saying the same thing, and we by him. You see, God the Father and God the Son are one. The Lord said that. He said, I and my Father are one. Whatever God's attributes are, are the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever God's purpose is, is the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're one. I and my Father are one. I love the way he said to Thomas, he that has seen me has seen the Father. All you and I will ever see of the God of glory is Jesus Christ, God's Son. There's one Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, He is Lord. That means He's your Lord. But I don't see that. He's still your Lord. He's everybody's Lord. Lord of the dead, that person who's dead in sins, He's their Lord. They don't know it but he's their Lord. That one who lives, he's their Lord and they know it and they love his Lordship. The Lord Jesus. Don't you love his name? Jesus, thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Christ, God's prophet, 
the Word of God. God's priest. God's king. I love it when that Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He knew he couldn't save himself. He he didn't say, what must I do to save myself? He said, what must I do to be saved? I love Paul's answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now to us, there's one God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's one Son of God, our Savior. Verse 7, how be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. For some, with conscience of the idol unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. There are some who, they have the knowledge of God. But they're weak in their knowledge. You know, I know a whole lot more than I did 10 years ago. I'm still aware that my knowledge is minuscule compared to what it ought to be. But I I know a lot more than I did 10 years ago with regard to the Bible, with regard to God. I know more than I did 40 years ago. Now, here is somebody who... They see that meat sacrificed to an idol and they think, I couldn't eat that. It would be sinful for me to eat that. That would be wrong. Being used for such desecrated purposes, I'm not going to eat that meat. That's what he's speaking of in verse 7. How be it there is not in every man that knowledge for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour Eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. If they did eat it, it would be sin to them, because they believed it to be sin. So if they eat it, it would be sin. Somebody says, well, the Bible says it's not. To them it is. Because if you believe something to be sin, and you commit that sin, to you it is sin, even if it's something you can say, well, that wasn't sinful. You see, God looks at the heart. God looks at the motive. God looks at more at why you do something than what you do. He looks at the heart. Now look at verse 8. Now, Paul says, but meat commendeth us not to God. Somebody says, well, I'm not going to eat that meat. I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to be true to my own conscience. I'm not going to eat that meat. You know how much that commends you to God? Zero. Zero. Somebody says, well, I got better sense than that. I know that meat doesn't commend me to God. I've got knowledge with regard to this thing. You know how much that means to God? Zero. Nothing. Meat commends us not to God. If we don't eat it, somebody says, I'm not going to eat it. You're no better for it. Well, I'm going to go ahead and eat it. That doesn't help you either. I think, hold your finger there and turn to Galatians chapter 5 for a moment. This will illustrate what's being said. For in Jesus Christ, verse 6, Galatians 5, verse 6, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision. Now, this is the same principle. Somebody says, I know I don't need to be circumcised. That avails you nothing. Somebody says, I need to be circumcised. That avails you nothing. What avails with God? Faith which worketh by love. Knowledge, the knowledge of faith that works by love. Now turn back to chapter 8. But, now here's a man that has knowledge. He understands I'm no better if I don't eat it. I'm no better if I do. It's a thing of indifference. It doesn't matter. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty 
of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. There is the weak brother, the brother who doesn't have the same understanding of knowledge of you at this time. We pray he will, but right now he's weak and he's got scruples that you could say those are ridiculous. Well, they are, but look at Paul, how Paul says your attitude toward that weak brother is. Four, verse 10. If any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple. You think, I know that there's nothing to that. I know that's meat sacrificed to an idol. That's a good filet mignon. That's a ribeye. I want something. I want some good steak. I'm going to go into that temple. I'm going to buy that steak. I'm going to sit down and eat it. And I'm going to enjoy every bite. I know there's nothing wrong with that. You'd be right. But what if that person who doesn't feel that way, he thinks it's sin to eat that meat. And he sees you eat it, and it emboldens him to go against his conscience and eat it because he sees you eat it. What about that? For if any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols. Well, he's doing it, I can do it. No right reason, just he's doing it, I can do it. And through thy, verse 11, through thy knowledge, shall thy weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Now, is that saying that person who's emboldened to eat that meat, even though Christ died for them, they're going to go to hell through your knowledge? Of course it doesn't mean that. Everybody that Christ died for will be saved. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep. Everyone Christ died for will be saved. What he's talking about is through your indifference toward your weak brother, you have emboldened him to eat meat when he knew it was wrong and you've, caused him to, you've brought him to sin against Christ and it's your fault. That's what he's saying. This is, this is knowledge without charity. It's not caring about your weaker brethren. Why why should I live up to his scruples? That's ridiculous. I can eat that meat if I want to. I don't care what he thinks. That's knowledge without love. Knowledge without charity. That's not caring about your brother. Now look what he goes on to say. But, 12, when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience... You sin against Christ. Now, if my brother feels like, oh, it'd be wrong to eat that meat sacrificed to idols. It'd be wrong. You know what I'm going to do if I practice love? I'm not going to eat it. But he's wrong. I'm still not going to eat it. And that's what Paul says. And that is knowledge with love. Love to your brethren. Not wanting them to be offended. Not wanting them to be emboldened to sin against Christ because of uh, a misunderstanding of my knowledge. He thinks it's okay. I must be okay. I'm going to go ahead and do it. He said, no, don't do that. Um, Wherefore, verse 13. If meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh. While the world standeth lest I make my brother to offend. Oh, may the Lord give you and I the grace to give up our rights and not look down at the scruples of others and live as Paul did. Now, I want to close by simply reading Romans chapter 14. The same thing is being covered here in Romans chapter 14. Now he talks about that weak brother. Him that's weak in the faith, receive ye. But not to doubtful disputations. Look, that guy's so wrong. Don't don't receive him like that. (coughs) For one, believeth that he may eat all things, another who's weak, 
eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Now, if you see somebody eating and you disagree with it, don't judge them. If you see somebody not eating and you disagree with them, don't judge them. Let's go on reading. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he should be holding up, for God's able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, he gives God thanks. For none of us live to himself, and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? Why, he's so ridiculous, not eating that meat. Is he that silly? Why are you setting him a knot? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he and you. We're all going to stand. For it's written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us therefore judge one not. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Do you hear that? Across the board. Let us not judge one another any more. Wouldn't it be a blessing if I never judged you again and you never judged me again? Now, it goes without saying that everything we hear, we have to judge to see if it's according to the word of God. But I'm talking about judging you, becoming your moral judge. He said, let's not judge one another anymore, ever again. Oh, make that your ambition. May I make that my ambition. But judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and persuaded by the Lord Jesus, there's nothing unclean of itself. You can eat that meat if you want to. There's nothing sinful in that. <coughs> but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not with him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness. His righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify, build up one another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for that man who eateth with offense. It's good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor Anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. If you can eat that meat, happy are you. There's not a thing in the world wrong with you eating it. You're happy in doing it. And verse 23, he that doubteth, he that feels like it's wrong for him to eat that meat, is damned if he eat, condemned. It's not talking about going to hell, but being condemned because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in Christ's name that we might be, by your grace, have knowledge that is not puffed up but it's with that charity that builds up Lord give us this attitude 
toward our weaker brethren, but we would not want to offend them. And Lord, give the weaker brethren the grace to not sit in judgment upon those who do what they disapprove of and think is wrong. Lord, enable us to obey this commandment. Let us not judge one another anymore. How we thank you for the knowledge of the gospel. Lord, cause that knowledge to bear fruit for your glory. In Christ's name we pray.